So just, uh, just before I erase all this, I just want to point out, in fact, the number of odd points of the star actually has to exactly equal uh, the cardinal of x plus 2. Because if, uh, if, it's, if it's greater than this, then you can connect 2 with an edge, and you still don't have a perfect matching. Um, so if, if it's greater than x, x plus 2, uh, the graph is not saturated. So. All right. But again, the f that fact is not needed to prove Tut's theorem, so. All right. So I want to shift topic. And uh, talk about the connection to, of matching to uh, determinants of matrices. And um, this, the, 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 this connection is central to coming up with uh, parallel algorithms for, for matching. And the reason is that is because we, we have a parallel algorithm to compute determinants. And so if you can compute a determinant, if we can reduce matching in parallel to determinants, then, then we can solve matching in parallel. So I'll start in the easy case. And I, I, I mentioned this in my talk on Wednesday. Let me just quickly go over it again. Let's, if, it, if I have G is bipartite. Um, e and... Uh, of course, these now it has to be equally bipartite. These, these, these have the same number of, of nodes. Um, we define an n by n matrix A equaling A i j, where, so here I'll let um, L equal u1 through u n and R equaling V1 through Vn. So Aij is equal to X sub E, where X sub E is a fresh variable. Um, if E equaling Uivj, if this thing is actually an E, and zero if u i v j is not an e. Okay. So this is just like the bi adjacency matrix, except instead of ones, I put a variable, and no two variables occur in the same spot. Okay. So uh, fact. Um, G has a perfect matching if and only if the determinant of A is not identically zero. <coughs> okay. And the reason is, is because the determinant of A, if you expand it, if you look at um, a uh, <coughs> if you look at if you if you um, uh, multiply, if you multiply one of the terms, you're going to be multiplying one, one variable from one row and, and uh, <coughs> another variable from another row and no two variables in the same column, the determinant of A is just going to be the sum. That's, that's equivalent to a perfect matching. So you're only going to get, if you're only going to get non-zero if you only have variables corresponding to E. So this is the sum over all matchings. Uh, <coughs> perfect matching. <coughs> of the sign of M um, times the product of E being an M of X of E. Okay. All right. So, and the sine of M is just the nat the <coughs> the sine of the permutation you get by just looking at M, and how it, how it permutes the the indices. All right. So. Th so obviously, if G has no perfect matching, then none of these terms are zero. 
if G does have a perfect matching, then some of these terms, at least one is zero, but none of the, no two of these terms cancel because every term uses different, different collection of variables, uh, different, different, um, uh, different pattern of variables. Okay, so no two terms cancel. All right, this does not give a randomized algorithm a uh, uh, randomized parallel algorithm for uh, perfect bipartite matching because this particular symbolic determinant, actually computing whether this is identically zero or not, you cannot do this, or we don't know if you can do this in, in NC. You can, however, by Berkowitz-Sankey algorithm, do it if you have, if you have actual values here or even if you have polynomials over a single variable, you can also do it. So you could, for example, so a typical thing to do is you, you assign a weight function to the edges, and then you substitute, <coughs> so assign, so weight function, um, W E into some set, <coughs> okay, and substitute, say, um, actually this will be natural numbers. Um, substitute uh, 2 to the weight of E for X sub E. Or you could just pick a single uh, 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 new fresh variable z and just take this to the power of e uh, for x of e, where z is a variable. Now this, that, that substitution will make this a univariate polynomial and you can apply, you can use the, the Berkowitz algorithm for univariate, that, that still works. Um, but this will work just as well, provided, but the problem of doing that, of course, is now, well, if, if G has no perfect matching, none of these terms are non-zero, so you'll still get zero. But if G does have a perfect matching, it's possible you'll have, you'll have non-zero terms here, but it's possible they'll cancel because of this weight function. And that will happen exactly when you have two, um, perfect matchings of equal weight. Then you can have canceling terms here. And so it's possible you get the wrong answer. It, it, you may still get the right answer if you have equal weight perfect matchings, but it's possible you get the wrong answer. But so in order to guarantee that this determinant is non-zero, the way, the way we have been doing it is to just ensure that there is a unique minimum weight perfect matching for this. Actually, I guess it's it not a unique perfect matching isn't quite enough. You need, it has to be minimum weight. Um, I'll do that. That will well if this one a unique uh, a unique perfect matching of a given weight, not necessarily minimum is is okay if you do it this way. It's sufficient for this. But for this, you want a unique minimum weight because then the unique minimum weight will be a power of two, and all the other terms will have higher powers of two. So they won't cancel. Okay. All right. So I this I, I went over this in my talk, so I, I don't want to dwell on so too much. Yeah. I use Schwartz Zipple. Yes. Uh, actually, yeah, I think, uh, I, think you, I think you're right. So, uh, in fact, you just, um, so you can, um, if you use this approach, then you just take, you know, a field that's big enough, and then you just apply random elements of Z. Okay, so this, will, this will be a polynomial, and it will be, um, if G has a perfect, oh, I'm sorry, no. If G 
has a perfect matching, it's still possible that this thing is identically zero, even if you're making these substitutions. Because you have positive, you have plus and minus signs here. So you could have a z to the sixth, and another term will be minus z to the sixth, and they'll cancel out. Well, it, no, it's still, you could, you might just get the zero polynomial. Even if there is a, even if there is a perfect matching, you still might just get the zero polynomial here. But what that means that uh, we can apply Schwarz Schwarz-Hilbert lemma to symbolic determinant and substitute uh, uh, values for uh, variables x, e. Mm -hmm. Not such type of substitution, but some random Oh, some random substitution for the x sub e. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, yeah, I see what you're saying. I know we should make this ICR to solve this problem right now, but probably you need less randomness because you probably pick weights from smaller sets. I'm not sure. Okay, so the way the isolation lemma has been used is you pick weights, you pick weights which are powers of two, <laughs> where the exponent is at most twice the number of edges. And that's perfectly sufficient. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so the, I think Schwarz will certainly can you can apply to this, and whether it's actually you get something better is a good question. Okay. Yeah. You said there was a problem that there are two minimal weights matching, two matchings of minimal weights. Well, if you use, if you're making that substitution. So if you have four, you, you're taking them in pairs, maybe? Is this what you're saying? So, so you remove one edge, mm -hmm. so the number of minimal matching, I, uh, you take them in. The number of minimal matching may remain uh, even, because, uh, well, if the number of minimal uh, matching okay. uh, is large, yeah. it can be exponentially large. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. But certainly you're right. If, if you only have an, if you have an odd number of, of minimum weight perfect matchings, then that also suffices here. So you don't need a unique one. Okay, yeah, all right. Good. All right. Um, so I want to do something similar now for general graphs. And for general graphs, we also have a connection to a determinant, but the connection is not, is not this simple anymore. Um, it's, a little bit, it's more complicated, and uh, so I want to do that connection. And um, so now let G equal V E general graph. V is uh, V1 through Vn and the size of E is equal to M. Then define the, um, the N by N tut matrix. And that's how you pronounce it, tut? I keep saying tutte, like it was Italian, but it's, he's not Italian, so. Tut. Tut, okay, thanks. Uh, tut matrix. Um, I guess I'll call it tut of G um, equals AIJ, where AIJ is equal to, well, you have three cases now. If this will be some X sub E, 
if now this is an undirected edge. If this is an E and I is less than J. And <coughs> you'll have minus X sub E. So these X, X's again are distinct variables, one for each edge. You'll have minus X sub E if I and J is in E and um, I is bigger than J. And then you have zero if otherwise. Okay. So that's called the Tut matrix. And what I want to show is that you also, you also get a character, uh, the determinant of this matrix also characterizes whether or not G has a perfect matching. I'm, I apologize. I'm assuming this is, this is Tut. <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, don't worry, Tut, I was not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I laughed too hard at that. Okay. G has a perfect matching if and only if the determinant of the Tut matrix of G is not identically zero as a as a multivariate polynomial. Okay. All right. So is it clear the theorem says? All right. <coughs> so let me just give an example of a Tut matrix so you get the nut, you get a feel for it. One two. 3, 4, suppose I have these edges and maybe that edge. Or I'm not, I'll do it the other way around. So suppose I have something like that. Then the Tut matrix is 4 by 4. Uh, what do I have? I have zeros along the main diagonal. I have an edge from 1 to 2, so this will be x. 1, 2, that's that edge. I'll have x, 1, 3, and I'll have an x, 1, 4. Okay. And then I have a minus x, 1, 2 there. So the indi index, you can always do the index, you know, in the, the indices in increasing order. Um, do I have 2 to 3? There's nothing on 2 to 3. There is 2 to 4. And so I'm going to have a minus x, 1, 3 there. So all the minus signs are in the lower triangle. And I'll have a 0 there. And I'll have a, um, there is a 3 to 4. And then this will be minus x, 1, 4. This will be minus x, 2, 4. And this will be minus x, 3, 4. Okay. So that's the Tut matrix. All right. <coughs> So, can, so let's write this Tut matrix out as a as th this determinant out. So, so let's I'll just call that T. So, what's the determinant of T? Well, T it's going to be as usual. It's the sum of a bunch of stuff, um, and this will be you know permutations over S sub N of, um, of uh, um, sine sigma <coughs> times A sub uh, the product over I of A sub I sigma I. Okay. That's a standard thing. So, if any of these has a zero in it, there, that term's not there. So, the terms that survive are where these are all non-zero, so these are all variables. Okay. What I want to do first, this, I'm going to do this in steps. 
what I want to do first is I want to split this sum up into groups according to what variables are mentioned <coughs> in, in this product. Okay. So this is equal to the sum over groups G of, of what I'll call um, D of G, where D of G is a sum of terms here corresponding to Uh, or let me say, all having, all mentioning the same variables. Okay, so, you know, if, if, if one of these say, you know, x12, x24, x13, minus x13, minus x34, that's going to be in one group. But x13, minus x12, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, x13, x24, minus x13, minus x24, that's in a different group. They mention different variables. Now, <coughs> terms in the same group, it's possible that the exponents on those variables could be different, and so they, they, there's no chance of them canceling. But for now, we'll just group the group, the, we'll still put them in the same group. Okay. So notice that each, yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, it's possible that I might pick <coughs> x1, x1, 2 squared in one term, then pick a, diff a square, a different thing in another term, but they're still in the same group because they still mention the same variable. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Um, okay. So it's, it's possible that, the, so things, things may or may not cancel within a group. But definitely, this is for sure, terms in different groups do not cancel. So, so that means that this matrix, uh, the, de the determinant G, is non-zero if and only if uh, some d g is non-zero, is not equal to zero for some g. Okay. If the determinant is zero, then all of these groups have to be zero. All right. Okay. So that means I'm just going to, now I'm just going to concentrate on a single group. This makes life much easier. So if I only mention uh, variables in a single group, I claim that this dg is going to be the determinant of a matrix. <coughs> and it's the determinant of a matrix I get by setting all the variables not in this, not mentioned here, to zero. And so I'm going to, any, any variable that's not mentioned in dg, I'm going to set equal to zero. And I take the determinant of that, the only terms that survive are exactly these. Okay, so that, uh, that seems reasonably clear. Okay. So dg is equal to the, the determinant of a matrix Tg, where Tg uh, is obtained from T by setting all of ours not mentioned 
in um, in in group G uh, to zero. Okay. So actually, the sum the determinant of t is actually the sum of determinants. I get this way. Now, if I set the variables not mentioned in G to zero, that corresponds to the so T G is the tut matrix of a subgraph. So the variables I set to zero, I'm just taking those edges out of the original graph. So let's look at that subgraph now. So TG um, is the tut matrix of a subgraph I'll call it G sub G so this G sub G actually has to be fairly simple yeah Uh, DG is a group of terms yeah. in the original determinant. So, okay, okay. So it's a sum. For one of the groups, the set of variables is a subset of the set for other groups. Uh, yeah, I think so. Because then probably sure. if, you, if you take a larger group and then you uh, uh, set all the extra variables to zero, and then you will also get the determinant terms that are for, for smaller subgroups. Right? Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. So that's so so you'll also get um, if you if you take if you say what you're saying if you take the subgraph, yeah. you'll also get terms in a different for group. Smaller, yeah, for smaller groups. Yeah, I think that's true. But that's, um, that's that's fine. Okay. That's I don't th that's not a, I don't think that's a problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, yeah, that's a good point. I'm not entirely sure it's possible that that happens. We'll see. Maybe, maybe it is. So if the smaller group will have, you know, a quadrat some quadratic terms in it, more more quadratic terms than the larger group does it doesn't have. Yeah. So. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's possible. Okay. All right. So let me. Uh, so so this will correspond to a group, and yes, that might in that that determinant might include determinants. Uh, that might include that'll include subgroups as well, if there are any. Yeah, and there could be. Okay. So, what does, what does one of these things look like? So, if you look at the original Tut matrix, the terms are going to, well, you take something from row one and you take something that's not a zero, you just, you just take something from row one, take something from row two, row three, distinct way, okay? Those are the only variables that show up in the, the, the variables you choose this way. Those are the only variables that are going to show up in this graph. Okay. It's symmetric as well. It's, it's right, and it's symmetric as well. So when, when, you, take the, when you take the tutty mate, uh, the, the tut matrix, you'll get an XE over here and you get a minus XE over here. Yes. And you'll get another. Uh, X e prime, and you get a minus X e prime there. Okay, so that makes it a little bit complicated. But let, let's see what that means. So, in any row or column, you have at most two non-zero components here, right? 
You can't have three. Um, and the only way you can get two distinct ones is if you have some other x e double prime down here minus in this row, in this column, and then you have to have an x e double prime over there. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so I'm looking, I want to I wanna look at the structure, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the structure of this, of this graph. And I'm looking at a group of variables that shows up in a single term of the determinant of the original Tut matrix. Well, if I take, I'll take some permutation and I'll get some variables, some are negated and some are not negated. Yeah, I'll set all the other variables to zero. <laughs> then if I look at the matrix that's left, I will not only have the enter that, that single permutation that I chose, but I'll also have, I'll also have the, its transpose. So I'll have to add its transpose. So I'm, actu I'm actually taking the original permutation matrix of the variables and subtracting its transpose, and that gives me that gives me the tut matrix of this subgraph. Okay. So a permutation minus its transpose can only have at most two things in each row and two things in each column. So what that means is that if you look at the subgraph here that you get, every vertex has degree, well, it has degree at most two. Okay. And in fact, you can say a little bit more than that. So, in, in uh, so I'll, I'll say it. So no, no more than, um, no more than two entries, two non-zero entries in any row or column of TG. Okay. So what that means is that in, in the corresponding graph, every vertex has degree at most two. So the degree of the graph is two. Um, and furthermore, um, I, even a little stronger than that. So it's, it is the union of paths and cycles, but the paths all have length one. So here's, here's, what, here's what G looks like. You have cycles. You may have cycles. Okay. Um, so here's GG. So you've got cycles like that. And they could be even or odd cycles. Okay. So there's an odd cycle. Here's an even cycle. Okay. <laughs> Here's a, here's a node of, uh, of degree, um, actually, yeah, in fact, you, it, one or two, yeah. And at least one, right, because, uh, yeah. because you, have, you have something non-zero in each row. <laughs> okay. So every degree, every node has degree one or two. The degree two things form a cycle. Look at the ones of degree one. If this has degree one, what, is it, what does it mean? It means if you look at the corresponding row, suppose that's node i, vi. You look at i, it only has one entry in it that's non-zero. Okay. Um, that means the corresponding, let's call that, the corresponding column i has one entry in it. Okay. This means that if you look to see, suppose now this is in column J, and then this will be in row J, then this is connected to VJ. But VJ um, also has, uh, let me check, VJ
they will also have both this X set E prime and X E double prime, and they will also have only X E prime. Yeah, X E double prime here. In zero, you only have X E prime. Um, I g okay, so I guess V J could actually be could be attached to another thing. All right. Right. Yeah. So, so the, that's the point. I can't. These, these both can't be there. I can't have both of these here. Because then I have two. Um, uh, let's see. <coughs> if I have this here and this here. Then I have that here and that here. Well, why can't I have that? I guess it's not that easy to show. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm going to do next. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So I, um, I, got, I, I guess I better leave that for the moment. Yeah, or length two if you, c it's a walk of length two, maybe. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. You can, we'll, we'll count these as, as even cycles. All right. So you have to go there and then back again. So it's a, a walk of length two. All right. So now the, um, So let, we can reorder the vertices. We can choose, reorder the labels any way, way we want to so that we cyclically order the vertices around the cycles, say. So this will be one, two, three, four, five. So this will be row one, row two of the matrix. And this will be six, seven, eight, nine. And then we'll take those. So let's see what that looks like. If you reorder this way, then, then this, it's easy to say that, well, that doesn't change the non-zeroness of the determinant at all. It, uh, sh but it, it, you, then you have manifest block diagonal matrix. So that uh, this cycle, that five cycle, just occurs here. And you'll have x1, 2, x2, 3, x3, 4, x4, 5, and then you'll have minus x1, 5, and you'll have x1, 5, and you'll have minus x1, 2, minus x2, 3, minus x3, 4, and minus x4, 5, and zeros along the diagonal. But right off the diagonal, you get this picture. So this is what this matrix looked like. Over here, all zeros, because this doesn't connect up with anything. You do the same thing over here, um, and you, in this case, block diagonalize like that, and this will be x6, 7, x7, 8, x8, 9, Minus x six nine, x six nine, minus x six seven, minus x seven. I'm sorry, uh, seven eight. Yeah, seven eight, and minus x eight nine, and zeros everywhere else. <coughs> okay, so is it clear the structure? And maybe for this guy, this guy you just have. Um, I guess I'll call this, um, I'll call this 10 and 11. You have x10, 11, and minus x10, 11. 
the two by two. Okay. All right. So now the determinant, and these are all zeros. The determinant of this matrix is the product of the determinants. So it will be uh, it will be um, zero just in case that any one of these blocks is zero, identically zero. Well, notice this block is not zero um, because of well, obviously it's not zero. Okay, and that's the case if you have a single edge. Okay. This is an even cycle, and I will argue that this is also non-zero. This corresponds to an odd cycle, and I'll argue that in this case, this is zero. So what I want to show, it, so now basically we've, we've reduced it to the case where we look at special matrices that either look like this or look like for an odd cycle or look like this for an even cycle, and we'll call this a cycle of length two. Okay. So the claim is that odd cycle determinants are all identically zero. Even cycle determinants are all non-zero. Okay. And this will give us one direction of the proof. So, <coughs> so let's, first of all, let's look at this one and see why it's zero. It's not too hard. Let's do the, let's do the um, recursive definition of determinant. So I'm going to, like, you go across the first row, okay? Um, so the only, non, the only two non-zero terms I get this way is if I either pick as my, uh, either x12 or x15. Suppose I pick x12. If I choose x12, um, then Notice that I can't choose x23 because it's in the same row. So I need a permutation. So that means I have to choose x34 because I have to choose something in that row that contains x23. But now if I choose x34, I can't choose x45 because it's in the same column. So the, the, the one that I have to pick in the last row is going to be x15, okay? But if I pick x15, now I can't pick x12 because they're both in the same column. So I have to pick x23, okay? Which means I can't pick x34 or minus x34 because it's in the same column. So I have to pick x45. Okay. And that's my permutation. So if I, let me say, if I choose, if, 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 my per, if the permutation term I get in the determinant includes x12, then it has to look like this. It has to correspond to a cycle, sort of a single cycle going around. Similarly, if, um, if a term in the determinant includes x1, this x15 over here, then it has to include exactly those other four. So in fact, if you look at the determinant, I get exactly two non-zero terms. I get this one and I get that one. Those two terms cancel because Yes, so th it, that's important. The size of the matrix is odd. So I have an, I have an odd number of, um, I have an odd number of minus signs, okay? Now, the difference here is I am reversing an odd cycle, so the sign of the permutation is actually the same. So I'm adding these two things together. One of them has no minus signs, and the other one has an odd number of minus signs. 
and the sign of the permutation <coughs> is the same in both cases because it's just an inverse permutation. So they cancel. All right. That's actually easier to say than to write down. <laughs> actually, there is a shorter proof. Oh, uh, okay. has no perfect matches. And we know that <laughs> if uh, top uh, matrix, the determinant of top matrix is a has no perfect matching, the determinant should be identical as zero. Uh, the I do we I think that's what I'm trying to prove. Uh, we, we now prove in the other direction, yeah. All right, so ah, uh, so if G if G ah, uh, so I see what you're saying. If G G has an odd cycle like this. That's just, it has no perfect matching. So, uh, so but uh, you, the, now, now you, you're not, in the bipartite case, it was clear that the determinant was zero in that case. But here, I don't think, it, it, it's not quite as clear. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. All right, so if, if you look at this determinant, you expand it out into terms. Yeah, maybe the problem is this way. So yeah. when, when we pick this permutation, we actually what we do, we just add the direction on edge. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In such a way that for each edge, there is, uh, for each vertex, there is there are no out two out domains and two in domains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, right, so basically for each variable. Well, you can do, of course, you can do, you have an edge with both directions. If, but if the cycle is odd, then it's impossible. Okay, yeah, all right, so that's another way of seeing it. So, so th here is just the, uh, so the determinant of this block here is equal to x12 x2, 3, x3, 4, just going one direction around the cycle. x4, 5, x1, 5, um, I'm sorry, minus. Because there is, there's one minus sign in that permutation, and then there are four in the other ones. So this will be a plus <laughs> x1, 2, <laughs> x2, no, 3, here, yeah. Two okay, slots, all right. You, when you count it, you use some rules and uh, build uh, the chain from these rules, and I didn't get the rules. Okay. This was my question. That's fine, that's fine, okay. So, I'm going to sum over all permutations, yeah. row permutations that I can, uh, the terms, where I have all non-zero components. So, let's look at so I have to choose something from the first row to get one of these terms. There, I have only two choices, x12 or x15. I'm going to do both, both of them. If I choose x12 here, then I can't choose x minus 2, 3 because it's in the same column. So I can't choose, so I can't choose that one. It's in the same column, which means when I get to this, the row that contained this. Oh, yeah, now I see it's like a row of Yeah. The column and so on, and this is the way right, so I'm just sort of chasing my way around the matrix and seeing that I'm really locked in to just one to one term. Yeah. Okay, but how do you look at the given cycle? Mm -hmm. Yes. You have some extra uh, not, uh, not mentioned here because you can pair the two, on two axes on the, in the top left corner and two axes from the right. Uh, yeah, so actually this is a bad picture. Let me write this again. Yeah, this is fine. So this is, I'll call this just uh, x, y. Um, yeah, it's, uh, right. So this is now minus z. I'm just going to use x, y, and z. And forget the, sub, uh, forget the uh, subscripts. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so what you so are you pairing the whole thing, the global determinant, just with the non-infinity and then you 
Right. So one, one term of this determinant is minus x squared minus w squared, and that doesn't cancel with anything else yeah, because... Right. Yes, right. And in general, for an even, for an even size matrix, you just, you, just group, you just group the blocks along the diagonal in twos, and you'll get quadratic terms that don't cancel with anything else. So this has to be non-zero. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. about previous part. Why yeah. are there no parts, only cycles? Why are there, yeah, so uh, I, I have to think about that. Why are there no paths and only, well, no. Why, are, why are there cycles and only isolated edges like that? So I claim is that either there is a cycle or the, there's only cycles <coughs> or isolated edges. Ah, yeah, okay. Right. Well, I'm just, I think, I think your question is, if I have something like that, why can't I have a three by three block that looks like x, y, 0, minus y, minus x, you know, something like that. That'll be, and, uh, No, but still, still, the starting representation, uh, we, we, we have, uh, we have 10 mega efficiency implementation and uh, transposing which, right? Yeah. But why do we start with 10 mega just, just, just to make it make the block structure um, clear. Um, because the element is the sum over permutation, oh, okay. and we yeah. group the terms in the expansion yeah. of the determinant. Yeah. And <coughs> okay. Yeah. So I guess you can't you can't have this. <coughs> Because the Tully matrix, yeah, you only have cycles because this determinant is zero. It's just that it, it, it doesn't have full rank. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think similarly for longer paths. So you only have, so if you have, if you have, um, if all of these are even, so you have no odd, no odd size blocks, then GG, so if, all even blocks, then GG has a perfect matching. And G, G sub G is just a subgraph of G. So uh, G has a P, M, because GG is going to consist of isolated edges that don't touch anything else and even cycles. So you for your perfect matching, you throw in the isolated edges, and then for each even cycle, you just take alternate edges around the cycle. And that, that covers everything. Okay, so that's one direction. That's one direction. It says that uh, if, um, so if the determinant of Tg is not equal to zero, um, then you get then this is true, um, and then this is true, and then that is true. Actually, in both directions. Uh, both directions, yeah. So the other direction is, 
if well, the other direction, if if G does have a perm, uh, does have a perfect matching, then just take the take the perfect matching as your subgraph, and that's going to be a single group, and that's going to correspond, and that's going to correspond to a matrix where each block has size two. Yep. So that's. Right, right. So if it's so contrapositively, if it's non-zero, then all the blocks have to be even. And so GG has a perfect matching just by reading off the edges. Okay. And all right. Okay. And then the converse is that if G has a PM look at block or look at group, I'm calling them group group corresponding. So, so if the G has a perfect matching M corresponding, uh, look at the group corresponding to M. So this is uh, all blocks of size 2. So the determinant, determinant for this block is not equal to zero, and that implies that the uh, determinant of the whole tut matrix is not equal to zero because the blocks don't cancel between each other. All right, so that's the, that's the whole thing. That's the whole proof. <sighs> okay. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions? I guess you've all been asking as we go along. Okay. So the last thing. Um, um, I guess I, all right, I, I can, I can, I have, how, um, how much time do I have? I guess. Ten minutes? Okay. Well, I started late, but I, I finished late the last time. So, 15, is 15 okay, maybe? Ah, uh, yeah, okay, you're right. We were, we were just, you know, just shooting the breeze up here. Well, okay, all right. So basically, this last theorem, this theorem, plus the isolation lemma, gives you an RNC algorithm. Oh, uh, sorry. Give, yeah, it gives you an RNC algorithm for general matching, uh, general perfect matchings. Okay, at least the, the decision problem. All right. And it's really, it, it's a little bit more complicated because you, now you have, instead of having, in, in the bipartite case, you just had individual terms and you isolate a single individual term that didn't cancel. Here you have to argue that you're, you, can, you can only really isolate groups. And you have to argue that within a group, um, it, it doesn't, it, do, it won't cancel with other groups. So there's a little bit more work to do, but it, 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 I, won't, yeah. I won't go into it. Uh, okay, Schwarzdippel. Okay, I like, I like that. <laughs> I'm just going to say Schwarzdippel from now on. <laughs> okay. Good. So uh, I want to, um, I guess, in the time I have left, I'll, I'll, I will just um, go over back over the linear programming um, characterization of bipartite, uh, bipartite matching, or, or, or bipartite perfect matching. I'll just do for the perfect matching case. So recall, yeah. Yeah, we're de we, we de-randomize the isolation lemma. Okay. So you think maybe de-randomizing de Schwarz-Dippel might also be? Not so easy, yeah. Okay. 
Ah, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Because here we're actually we're actually picking wave functions to get to a corner of the polytope, and that's going that that's gonna isolate a minimum weight matching. And so yeah, I can't I can't imagine that would work for Schwarz bulb, but then okay. <coughs> so recall from Wednesday. Um, so we identify. So I, guess I suppose I should mention that for the for the record. So polynomial identity testing is you're just given two multivariate polynomials and you want to see if they're equal. Or equivalently, a, poly, uh, uh, a multivariate polynomial given as some kind of arithmetic circuit representation. You want to see if it's identically zero. And there's a randomized parallel algorithm for this. It's an RNC and it, it's schwarz -Zippel. Okay, good. So, I, so you just... I evaluate the, the, the circuit on random points in parallel. Why is the RNC so clearly a circuit not to need uh, on given fixed inputs? Oh, uh, B, oh, um, okay. The circuit might be polynomial. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. All right that, that's right. It's in. Uh, it's hard to compute. Yeah, you're right, you're right. It's in, it's in RP, but it's not in RNC, you're right, because of the circuit. Yeah, but, but, but for formula, if, you, if it's formula, then it's not great. Oh, it's about formulas. Okay, all right. Circuits were on before the terminals, and usually it does not uh, set uh, So a formula has log depth, right? And so then, yeah, yeah. then, so then it works just fine. Right. So, so okay. you could you could try the same thing. You could try to work with the randomized Schwarz Zippel for this this case, which maybe would mean that you would randomize only the determinant polynomials. But actually, the determinant polynomials are complete. But if you have, if you have any circuits, any small circuits, right? So I see. Yeah. We have special determinants here. Not a general case of determinant uh, circuit, uh, but if we have very simple uh, polynomial, the variables <coughs> in the bipartite case is all very tight distant. And in the general, uh, for general graph, we have only two occurrences of each variable. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very spe specific case. So yeah, so it's not universal. Individual degree two. On the on the on the uh, yeah right okay so I'm going to identify a set of edges so I have a graph in general it's it's a general graph I identify a set of edges with its characteristic vector oops x in the the real edge space. So here, x and e is just equal to 1 if e is in s and 0 otherwise. Okay. This is for any set of edges. Just identify it with its characteristic vector. And this is, this is, on, this is a 0, 1 vector, so it's on the hypercube. And this is in m dimensions, so that's a size v. Okay, so uh, define the perfect matching polytope uh, PM of G. This is equal to the convex hull of, of X such that X is a perfect matching of G. So I'm, identif I'm identifying sets of edges with their characteristic vectors. I'm just sort of, so uh, is it clear, the definition? All right, so this is, a, this is a polytope. It lies inside the hypercube, okay? And the theorem, which as far as I know, 
I could easily be wrong on this. As far as I know, it's due to Lovas. It's in Lovas and Plummer, and I've looked at it, and they, they, I didn't find a citation for it in their book. Um, but I, I might just not have been looking that hard. Um, so theorem. So I'll just say Lovas, and there's a is there on, on Lovas, I think. Plummer. Um, if G is bipartite, then X is in the perfect matching polytope, if and only if um, all of these values are at least zero uh, for all E. And if you sum up um, X sub E over the edges touching a vertex V, this equals one, and this is for all V and V. All right. That should be instead a reformulation of your uh, Oh, okay. Uh, convex uh, whole of by stochastic matrices are permutation matrices. Good. Okay. Two Fs in Birkhoff, I think. In uh, terms of matrices, uh, this is the same. Okay. Could you say that one more time? Uh, so. The stochastic matrix mm -hmm. uh, is a matrix such that uh, all end is non-negative and uh, source of all rows and all columns are... Okay, so doubly stochastic, yeah, all right. Doubly, do, do, oh, do, doubly stochastic. Sorry. Okay. Uh, in, in Russian, D stochastic. <laughs> oh, D <laughs> stochastic, <so>, okay. <laughs> doubly stochastic, yes. Mm -hmm. And if it, uh, it's a polytope, the term first. And mm -hmm. the original theorem says that vertices of this polytope is just permutation matrix. Ah, uh, right, right. And so, yeah, so yeah, the, right, the, the contents of... Matrices are perfect matrices. Yes, good. So, yeah, so the every doubly stochastic matrix is a convex combination of permutation matrices. That's this theorem, yeah. So that follows from this. Okay. So here... Um, so uh, one direction is clear. If you have a... If you have a perfect matching, then it has to satisfy all of that. That's obvious. Okay. And since this is a convex set, if you have a convex combination of perfect matchings, it certainly has to satisfy this. So the converse is, if you have a point that satisfies these two, then it has to be in the convex hall of the perfect matchings. So that's the hard part. Well, it's the it's the... It's, it's still easy, but not as easy. And that's probably, that's, that's the last thing I'll show, and then I'll be done. Okay. If that's all right. And I'll just get your proof. So, uh, if X in convex, if, if X in PM of G, then X satisfies those constraints. And that's E. Okay, converse. So the way to show this is that the only corners you can have are integral corners. So first of all, notice uh, so, con so conversely, so note any integer vector satisfying the constraints um, is a perfect matching. Okay. So for every, you'll have exactly one, one incident to every edge. Okay, and that gives you a perfect matching. Um, oh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm assuming G is bipartite. Okay. So, so it suffices to show no corners of PM 
g that are not integral. All right. So let's, given a non integral uh, element of the polytope, I'm going to show that, or sorry, given a, sorry, given a non integral vector that satisfies these constraints, what I'll do is I'll find, um, uh, that's, in, that's in the polytope, what I'll do is I'll find points on either side such that this point is a, con is a proper convex combination of the two points on opposite sides, or say even the midpoint, and that's enough. So, so given a uh, non-integral x satisfying the constraints, So what is x going to do on, so there's at least one edge that's given a non-integral uh, contribution by x. Suppose it's this one. Okay. Uh, this, this might be a familiar so argument to people. Two points in hmm? You're going to find two integral points in convex surfaces. Uh, no, I'm going to find just, just two points that satisfy these constraints. So what I'm showing is that the only corners of this polytope are integral. Okay. So if I have an element that's satisfying these constraints that is not integral, it's not then it's not a corner. Okay. Yeah, so that's it. That's it. So you, you, you're, you, that, you, you, you have it. So if this is not integral, then because of this constraint, this constraint has to be tight at this vertex here. So there has to be at least one other edge coming out of here that's also non-integral. Suppose it's this one. But now the same constraint is tight right there. So there has to be another one. And this, you go back and forth like this, and eventually what, you'll have to, what has to happen is that you'll eventually get back to this point. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. So, yeah, so maybe not the original. Maybe you, maybe you started over here. Okay. So at some point you come back to some place, and at this point you have a cycle. In this case, it's a four cycle of non-integral vectors. Well, now you can just tweak the contributions on this cycle. You can subtract some epsilon from here, add it to there, subtract it from there, and add it to there. You still satisfy, as long as epsilon is small enough, because these are non-integral weights, you still satisfy this. That gives you a point y. And then to get uh, a point z, you just do the opposite. You add epsilon here, subtract epsilon here, subtract epsilon here, and add epsilon here. That gives you another point z. And the midpoint of these two things is x. And y and z are both satisfying this. Okay, that's the whole proof. Okay. Thanks. I'm I'm done. Any questions? Okay. Thank you.